this talks on diversity and, di and dispersal of tropical forests by Larry Asa. Rue Vandegrift is a PhD candidate from the University of Oregon in the lab of Dr. Biddy Roy. He studies plant-fungal interactions and has a particular interest in symbiosis. This has led to a diverse group of projects that have covered everything from mycorrhizae and climate change, invasive grasses, and epicloe endophytes to tropical tree endophytes in the Zyleriaceae. Rue grew up as an Air Force brat. Sorry, I was in the Navy. <laughs> he completed his undergraduate degree in Virginia Tech studying under Dr. Robert H. Jones, then worked in biotech for several years. After that, he decided to go back to ecology. He worked as a technician for Dr. Brenda Casper at the University of Pennsylvania for a year, and then started graduate school at the University of Oregon. In addition to fungal ecology, Rue has a great interest in biological, and in particular, mycological illustration. He draws whenever he can, pry himself away from his dissertation, and sometimes even when he can. Rue Bennett. Wow. Thanks, everybody. The larger crowd than I was expecting. This is awesome. Um, so I am going to tell you about some of my dissertation work. Um, uh, a big chunk of my uh, dissertation research is on diversity and dispersal of tropical Silariaceae. Uh, so first, let's, let's introduce the players of the game. Um, probably the member of the group that most people here are familiar with is Silaria hypoxylon, the candles, not fungus. Uh, you can see on, I was actually, this is a larger room, I was kind of expecting to be able to point, but I can't. Um, Just speak up. On the left there, you'll see it in the conidial phase. It's young, when it's young, it's white. When it ages, it gets black, then parathesia develop from underneath. Uh, these are parathesial haplomyces. So in the other big group of fungi. Uh, and here on the west coast of temperate North America, we don't have very many. Uh, you see this one fairly regularly, but you don't see much else. In the tropics, they're incredibly diverse. And they come in uh, very interesting shapes and sizes. They're larger, they're uh, a little bit more colorful, they're still generally black and crusty, but, um, but they're interesting. Uh, this is a Xyleria schwingitzii from Ecuador. Um, same genus, Xyleria tuberoides. You might have noticed this one out, this, actually this particular specimen out on the table downstairs earlier. Um, Xyleria <coughs> scruposa. Um, so in the tropics, um, these things are incredibly diverse. There's actually more than 500 described species in the genus Xyleria alone. Um, so why am I interested in them? To take a moment and contemplate the fact that plants are not just plants. Every plant lives in association with fungi. Um, we, we hear about, we know about mycorrhizae. Uh, it's kind of the most common symbiosis. But in addition to mycorrhizae, there are endophytes. Um, every plant studied to date has been in association with fungal endophytes. Um, and largely, uh, the role that they play ecologically for the plant, for themselves, is fairly unknown. Um, and Xyleria are important because they're one of the most ubiquitous endophytes in the tropics. Um, this is our field site in Ecuador. Pretty much every leaf you see there, if you could, if you could look deep within, you'd find the Xyleria. Uh, and I want to know why. Um, but they're also important because they're uh, one of the more ubiquitous wood decomposers in the area as well. Um, Xylarias, uh, some estimates say, account for up to 20% of the decomposition of wood in the tropics. Uh, it's a huge amount of carbon cycling that these fungi are doing. So they're ubiquitous endophytes, they're ubiquitous wood decomposers. Um, so I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Why is the most common wood decomposer also one of the most common endophytes? Uh, and I think what's going on is that endophytism is being used as a means of dispersal in these fungi. Um, I've also got some, some uh, more organismal biology questions regarding these fungi. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about today is whether or not they're outcrossing, uh, and then whether or not these hilarious associated flies, we'll talk about in a little bit, are important to their sexual reproduction. Uh, so let's, let's kind of go through, uh, this is sort of my proposed life cycle. These are, these are what I think is going on and the questions that I'm trying to test. So if we start at A, on the bottom right, um, these are wood decomposers, Hyphal growth in wood. It's a good place to start in a life cycle. Um, from there, they fruit, and when, the, when, they, when they're young, they're 
coated in white canidia and are associated with these flies. Uh, and what I am attempting to test is whether or not these canidia are actually spermatia um, and they function like pollen in plants. Um, so that's, that's a question, question number one. Uh, and then the stromata develop, ascospores form, uh, these are presumed to be infective, and they move into the canopy and become endophytes. How do they get there? Uh, are the flies involved in dispersal? Um, is wind dispersal? And then once they're in the canopy, uh, is there any kind of leaf-to-leaf -leaf, uh, dispersal? Is there some kind of asexual reproduction that we're unaware of? Uh, and then from there, clearly, um, they move back, the leaves are shed, and what I think is happening is that when leaves are shed, they're forming dispersal units, um, and they can colonize wood from a leaf. Um, so let's talk about endophytism being used for dispersal for a moment. Uh, why, why is this important? Could you uh, define that first? I forgot what it means. Oh, endophytism, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I've been talking to too many scientists. Uh, endophytism, uh, an endophyte is, endo means inside and phyte means plant. Uh, so an endophyte is a fungus that lives within plant tissues uh, without causing visible disease. Uh, so it's kind of broad, it's defined this sort of broad functional uh, thing. Uh, so it's not a disease causing fungus. Uh, it's not necessarily a mutualist fungus. It's just a fungus you find living within the leaf. And traditionally it's been defined like uh, very functionally. If you uh, sterilize the surface of a leaf and then put it on some culture media, what fungi grow out? Those are the endophytes. Um, so, xyleria are really common endophytes and nobody's really quite sure why. Are they helping the plants? Are they hurting the plants? Are they, you know, what are they doing? Uh, they're definitely living underneath of the, the cuticle of leaves in the tropics. So what you're saying is you can culture them on agar because they're saprobic inside the leaf. They're, well, they're not necessarily, you can culture... Um, when you say, you're, what are you culturing them on? Uh, you, you culture them on agar. They grow out, you know, they're, they're, they're culturable fungi. They're not, they're not, um, but you can culture, you know, you can culture things that are biotrophic as well. Um, depends on the conditions. It's, it's kind of a, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> to move on. Um, the, the dispersal. So, you know, they're living in the leaves. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in it from the dispersal angle. Um, and why do I think leaves might be a good unit of dispersal, um, where there's some evidence that fungal spores don't, don't fall very far from the fruiting bodies that produce them. Uh, this is from a study out of Van Pringle's lab, uh, where you can see 95% of the spores fall within a quarter meter of the fruiting body that produces them. Um, there is some, you know, depends on the fungus, clearly, um, but, you know, spores, they're small. These fungi, these are wood decomposers, they fruit near the ground in a, an environment that doesn't have very much wind, at least our forests in Ecuador. Um, so, how do they get around? Leaves, on the other hand, this is some data I collected in Ecuador. Um, these are two species of tree in two different families um, with uh, fairly obvious leaves that you can pick out from the forest background. Leaves fall much farther from their trees. 95% of these leaves fall within 20 meters uh, of their tree instead of 25 centimeters, right? So, farther dispersal. Um, so, here's kind of a schematic. What's going on? We've got a leaf, we've got some wood, We've got the yellow is the fungus within the leaf. Um, this is the conceptual model. Um, first, being an endophyte gives you this persistence in the environment. Even if you're, you're not really getting much from the leaf, you're persisting. The longer you can persist, the more likely you are to survive to reproduction. Um, gives you increased dispersal distances, like we just talked about. Um, gives you some amplification. Uh, if you can grow competently within a leaf, um, you can um, potentially start with a, a, a much greater mass um, than a single spore. Um, it gives you this adventitious microclimate um, when a leaf, uh, you know, presumably the, these fungi are, are using these leaves as dispersal vehicles. Um, it gives you this, this place to get started from. Um, <coughs> and it gives you um, protection from incoming anoxia. Yeah. Why can't I say that word? Protection from competitive inocula. Um, basically, if you're starting in the leaf, anything that wants to get to the wood that your leaf has fallen on has to get through that leaf first. You get a little bit of a head start in space. Um, so, so there are a couple of ideas. Um, the distance is I think, the greatest issue for me. Um, so, went to Ecuador, wanted to answer a couple of questions very specifically. I wanted to know what species of Xyleria were present, uh, both fruiting on wood in the, in the forest and um, as um, endophytes in the forest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to know whether or not there was a spatial pattern to their 
distributions, um, do we see a linkage between the fruiting bodies on the ground and the endoplexin in the canopy? And that will tell us whether or not they're using the endoplasmal signals in dispersal. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, sort of corollarily, if there's host specificity. Um, these forests are incredibly diverse, and the specificity of host, if, you're, if you only find certain species of Silaria as endoplexin, certain species of tree, um, that severely limits the ability uh, for these fungi to use endophytism as a means of dispersal. So it's kind of a, um, it, it, makes us, it makes it so we need to rethink our hypothesis if we find evidence for host specificity. Um, so what we did, we went to this place called Reserva Los Cedros. It's on the west, western slope of the Andes in Ecuador. Um, This is the reserve that you're seeing um, from up on the ridge. There's that one little building right in the middle um, is uh, part of the biological station there. Uh, it's in the cloud forest. It's at 1,200 meters elevation, right in the cloud condensation layer. Um, it's about 60 kilometers northwest of Ecuador. Um, again, I was expecting to be able to point to that, but uh, northwest of Quito, pardon me, 60 kilometers north of Quito. So it's not very far from Quito, but it is the only unlogged watershed on the west side of the in Ecuador. Um, the deforestation in Ecuador is, is intense, particularly on the west side. Um, it's thick forest, um, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Um, you can see Ecuador in that bright red-pink region uh, there. It's just it's a wonderful place to work. There's a diversity of hosts, there's a diversity of fungi. Um, it's a very important from a biodiversity perspective. Um, it's difficult to get there. Uh, it's only 60 kilometers from Quito, the capital of Ecuador, but it takes an entire day to get there. Um, you take a bus as far as it'll go to this little town of Chantal, um, where you hire a truck, and the truck drives you to the very end of the road where you meet the mule train. You bundle all your gear up onto the backs of mules, and you go for four hours up into the mountains in knee-deep mud uh, to get to the biological station, and on the way up, <laughs> you see um, secondary, secondary forest and forest that's been cleared for agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of cattle ranching, uh, despite the rain, and a lot of banana farming and cassava farming. Uh, and the, the forest still looks so great on the way up until you hit the border of the reserve, and then the forests are pristine and amazing. Um, this has been preserved um, uh, in some ways. It, it's despite the Ecuadorian government, um, by a dedicated team of conservationists. It's um, 17,000 acres of primary cloud forest. Uh, and the, the reserve has uh, some, some amenities. It's a little biological station with a, uh, some staff that lives on site. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful kitchen with that. Uh, this food provided, absolutely wonderful food, actually. Um, and our, our, our nod towards entertainment is ping pong table. Um, there's a little tiny micro hydroelectric plant in one of the streams that provides just a smidgen of electricity, um, which uh, was really helpful for our work. Um, and every now and again, despite it being cloud forest, the clouds break and you can see all the way into the Andes. Um, it's a, a lovely place. And the biodiversity is astounding. Um, there's a huge diversity of moths in particular. Uh, butterflies, not so much, but moths. Um, this is a, a, a moth that feeds on Cecropia, uh, which is a really common tree, but it's in the Urticaceae, which is the nettle family. Um, so this is kind of this astounding to me, trees yeah. in the nettle family. Um, there's a great diversity of birds as well, with this common toady flycatcher, uh, as well as uh, many other just amazing macroscopic things. Uh, there's, a, there's a chokutukan on the upper left, and a rosy-faced parrot uh, to the right there. Uh, we have troops of capuchin monkeys that just breeze right through the reserve. Um, not very friendly, but very adorable. Um, and then these, these glass frogs that come out at night, you can actually see their organs when you shine a flashlight on them. Um, peculiar things. All right, so that's, so that's Reserva Los Cedros. Um, what we did there, is we set up a spatially explicit grid to test these dispersal hypotheses. Um, we set up 120 points. This is a part of a, a forest plot that was used to sample trees uh, several years ago. So the, the points were actually already set, and we had 
uh, some tree data. Um, the points are five meters apart in the north-south direction, and 10 meters apart east-west. So it covers about a half a hectare. It's like a football field of forest, uh, which is not trivial to tromp around in, in these woods. Um, and then at each point, uh, we collected all the xylaria within a 1.2 meter radius, uh, and then as well as two leaves um, from the closest tree to, to sample endophytes from. And then we're using ITS as a standard fungal barcode gene so that we can match the stromata we collect on the ground with the endophytes we culture from the leaves um, with a short leaf. Uh, and the idea is, uh, within our grid, where we find fruiting bodies, say we find fruiting body A at these two points and B at these two points, um, and then we find uh, the same fungi as endophytes at these points, um, we can match distributions in space uh, to find evidence of dispersal limitation. Uh, this takes a lot of work. Uh, these forests are not trivial to work in. We had a, a crew of people. Um, it's me on the right there, and uh, my uh, lab mate Dan Thomas on the left, and then the fellow in the blue hat is our botanist, Danilo. Um, Danilo Simba is an Ecuadorian botanist. He's uh, invaluable to us. He uh, ducked every time we pointed the camera at him. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the field crew is Danny, you've already met, Fausto and Martin. Um, can think of as park rangers for the reserve, uh, were utterly invaluable for our sample collection. Uh, dedicated undergraduate, Matt Davis, uh, our botanist, Danilo. Uh, it's me and my advisor, Biddy Roy, uh, had an active hand in the field work as well. Uh, and we found um, lots and lots of really diverse cellarias, <laughs> as you might expect. Um, this is just a, a handful of some of the, the species we recovered. This is a cellaria physicalis on the upper left, um, Xyleria schwanitzii to the right there. Uh, bottom left is Xyleria pianto-valiotina, which I think is one of the prettier names in the group. It's a very slender, beautiful fungus. Uh, and Xyleria tilfarii. Um, uh, this specimen was actually down on the table downstairs. Um, found uh, one of the more common fungi we collected was this uh, Xyleria venosula um, uh, for the venous striping. Um, it's really interest has this interesting, distinct um, separation of asexual and sexual uh, morphology. Uh, the asexual stromata often have this intensely branched um, tip, as you can see here. Um, and as, as, um, and as was mentioned, I have an interest in illustration, so I've been working on uh, drawing some of these um, Ecuadorian xylarias. Um, I'd like to put together, uh, once I finish my PhD, I'd like to spend some time and put together a, a wee book on cloud forest cellarias from Ecuador. Um, this is another really interesting one. This is actually a very, apparently, supposedly, fairly rare fungus. <coughs> um, well, it turned up several times in our collections. This is Cellaria uh, camosa, or, or a, a fungus that's very like Cellaria camosa. Um, there are some differences of the gen uh, in the genetics and morphologically, uh, but it's been called Cellaria. Um, it's uh, largely striking for, as it develops, it has this yellow uh, coloration uh, underneath of the comedial coat, uh, as well as these hairy stipes, um, which are really interesting. Um, and these really like, this really interesting crackled surface to the mature uh, stromata. This is another one that has been uh, worked up some drawings of. Um, I think it's one of the, the more beautiful of the, the specimens we found. Another one of my particular favorites, this one was also down on the table downstairs. Uh, this is Xyleria hyperithra. Um, it's one of the, the tallest in the genus Xyleria. Uh, these can be up to a foot tall. Uh, according to, I've, I've never seen them quite that big. Um, the ones we collected top out at about 11 inches. Uh, they're huge. Um, and they have this beautiful red-orange color. Um, uh, again, underneath the canidial coat. And it goes away as the parathesia develops. <laughs> One of the smaller ones. This is a canidial form of Xyleria multiplex. It's a common tropical species. And you'd see these things fruiting by the thousands on logs about as big around as your arm. Um, so large macroscopic species. This one was also down on the table. Uh, Xyleria uh, enterogena on the left and Xyleria tilfarii on the right. Uh, two closely related species. Um, dis distinguished by one of them having slightly smaller spores than the other. Um, there's the Xyleria tilfarii again. Uh, one of the things our sampling scheme lets us do that's uh, kind of unique, because we're barcoding everything we collected, um, it lets us match asexual
sexual um, stromata with sexual forms that is you know, usually in a, a broad collection of fungi like this, the asexual stromata, um, they just get left as Zylaria stuff. Um, but because we have these fungal barcodes, we can say, oh, this is what the asexual form of Zylaria telfarii looks like. Um, this is, I have not, you know, I, I've talked to mycologists that know what it looks like, but I haven't seen it published anywhere. Interesting. Uh, we also found uh, other xylariaceous um, genera. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most interesting. This is a Phamnomyces. Um, beautiful, uh, fine, fine fungus with a parathesia born outside of the main body. It's, it's very delicate, very delicate. Um, this species, um, this uh, specimen, unfortunately, is sterile, um, but it's likely an undescribed species. Uh, and they just, I don't know, that it's fascinating to me. And just for a sense of scale, there's the centimeter mark in this one. Um, very delicate, and they look like they should be, they look like they should be very flexible, sitting on the tree like that, but they're actually incredibly brittle. It's like glass, it just shatters when you touch it. Um, we found you know, lots of fungi that weren't silariaceous at all, and mycenas coming out of the leaves. Um, and this, the cloud forest of Ecuador is particularly diverse in Caprinus, which is surprising, um, uh, among other things. Uh, actually, this one I've never gotten any kind of solid identification on. Anybody has any ideas? Yeah, you know? um, and then the, the scale of this forest um, amazes me. Uh, this, this tree is two meters in diameter. Uh, it's in the, the frankincense family. And those polypores are about a meter across. Uh, and they're see in the left-hand picture, they just stack up as far as you can see. Uh, and they were, they were so far out of reach, I couldn't, you know, they were probably 12 feet, 13 feet off the ground at least. Um, just, you know, I, I, they were huge. <laughs> uh, but no idea what they were, because I couldn't get close to them at all. Uh, other interesting ascomyces, um, uh, including, we actually, because they look kind of zelaria like we ended up collecting a bunch of quartz um, And this is interesting, this, you know, they, 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 I, we're still working on positively IDing this one, um, but we, we collected it a number of times in the stink bugs, um, as well as cordyceps and beetle larva. Um, and cordyceps can come in some really interesting colors, too. Um, but in addition to collecting fungi, we also collected leaves to culture endophytes from. And the, the, this is an incredibly diverse forest. Um, the, the est it's estimates that there's about 300 species of tree per hectare. Uh, not 300 trees per hectare, 300 species of tree per hectare. Uh, so we, we collected leaves from 120 trees, um, covering about 80 species, um, randomly sampled. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a, a I can never pronounce that genus, uh, Gisianthus. Uh, so the Primulaceae, the Primrose family. Uh, so again, lots of things that we think of as herbaceous are treated in the tropics. Uh, our most common uh, tree, I think we collected it 15 times, is Ferramea. It's in the coffee family. Um, that just gives you an idea of the scales of things we were working at. Big leaves and little leaves. Um, and then from each leaf, we cultured endophytes uh, using a very, very dilute malt auger. Uh, we actually built, you can see all the way on the right-hand side, um, we built this tiny, low-power uh, laminar sterile flow hood uh, to take with us that ran off the microhydra. Uh, we had to shut off everything else. We couldn't run it at night because the lights were running. Mm -hmm. So we shut off everything else to run our flow hood. Um, you can see the pressure cannon on the, at the foot of the table. That's our autoclave, connecting sterile media. Um, and in the end, we ended up with more than 1,500 cultures um, at a field station in the middle of the jungle. Um, uh, the undergraduate, Matt Davis, who came with us, was, was absolutely instrumental in making this work. Um, and in the end, we cultured, um, we ended up finding we cultured a bunch of cellulitis, which is good. Um, this is a, a couple examples of cellularian culture. Um, our most common culture is actually um, uh, various species of Colocotricum, uh, which is a, a, another data set that I'll probably play with at some point. But we have lots of Colocotricum cultures. If you know anybody interested in Colocotricum, let me know. So in the end, we recovered Xylaria fruiting in 68% uh, of our plots. Um, and these are, uh, I'll explain these real quick. This is a species, species, or species accumulation curve. This is kind of a, a way to say, did you get what was there? Um, and so for the saprotrophs, that's the, the fruiting bodies on the ground, um, you can see that curve kind of levels out towards the top, uh, which means within what we were looking for, uh, we probably captured most of what was there. Um, the, the statistical estimate for the number
number of species present is uh, 31 or 32 plus or minus 2. Um, and that fits, we recovered 31 species. Um, the uh, endophytes, we didn't do so well. Uh, so this tells us in the future, we need to sample more intensively to recover the endophytes that are present, uh, which in a culture scenario, given that we have 1,500 petri dishes floating around, is difficult. Um, but as far as spatial correspondence, these are our two most common Silaria endophytes. Uh, the green is where we found it as an endophyte. The red is where we find it as a saprotroph, and the yellow are places where we found it with both. Uh, and it's interesting in that there is very little in the way of pattern here. Um, and uh, the way the way we're interpreting this data at the moment is that um, uh, we're, a football field is not large enough to see the kind of dispersal patterns that we were hoping to see, uh, which in hindsight doesn't seem all that surprising to me. Um, we did, however, find um, an awful lot of species. Uh, this is just a, a abundance curve. How many times did we recover various and sundry things? Um, and you'll notice that on the right-hand side of that graph, there are a number of species without names. Um, some of that is because we just haven't figured out what they are. Um, a good handful of those are undescribed species that we're, we're working with uh, taxonomists to write up. Um, but um, the described species include things like this crush maria on the upper left. Um, it's a, one of our, our most common endophyte Silarius, Silaria physalis on the upper right here. Uh, Xylaria telfarii in the conidial state, again, on the bottom left, and uh, Xylaria schwannitzii, uh, which was not recovered as an endophyte, but was one of the most common saprotrophs we recovered. Uh, all in all, uh, we've identified a long list of um, species, some of which are new to, to Ecuadorian cloud forest collections. Um, <coughs> skip right over that, actually. Uh, it's, I don't know, phylogenetic. Um, <laughs> Um, so, the, the next question that I was interested in is how Zylaria is outcrossing. So we worked on this uh, a little bit in Ecuador, and I'll be working with going back to Ecuador in the spring this year and to do um, uh, another larger set of experiments um, <coughs> dealing with uh, heterothalism and Zylaria and insects. So this heterothalism just means do they have sex, basically. Um, so there's, there is a long history of, of heterothalism and insect associations. Lots of fungi associated with insects for for pollination, for lack of a better term, moving uh, sexual spores back and forth, moving nuclei, basically, so that recombination can happen. Um, for example, vaccinia rusts, um, which are the uh, associated with these arabis plants in the Brecht mustard family, um, like this. So what you're looking at here is not a butterfly on a flower. What you're looking at is a butterfly on a pseudo flower created by a rust fungus. Um, these fungi mimic flowers um, to attract pollinators uh, in just the same, for the same reason flowers attract insects for pollinators. Uh, and the mimicry goes all the way to visual and olfactory cues. These fungi smell like flowers. Um, and this particular one associates with the arabis, uh, creates these pseudo flowers that mimic the, um, the arabis flowers themselves. It's the same pollinators for both the fungus and the flower. Really interesting. Um, closer to the xylarias, uh, epicloe in grasses associates with flies for pollination. When it's young, it's coated in white canidia, associates with flies. They track the sexual propagules back and forth, sexual spores, um, and then it allows recombination to happen and the parathesia develop underneath uh, later in the season. That's these orange, this orange fungus. You see it on um, the crow's foot grass around, I think you see it around here, right? Uh, in, in, in Oregon, you see it really regularly on the, the dactylus, the crow's foot. Um, and we think, I think, Zylaria are doing something similar. We see, like the epicloe, we see a strong temporal separation of uh, asexual um, spore production and sexual spore production. And we see in their young stage, many Zylarias produce uh, sticky, bright colored exudates. Um, this is Zylaria globosa. Um, and these, you know, fun, like, this kind of exudates kind of just, they just suggest this attraction for insects. Um, and lots of Silarias do it. This is Silaria ascendens. Um, and we find Silarias in this stage strongly associated with flies. Uh, These uh, are dipterans, little fruit flies. Um, they, you find them on lots of different species, only in the neotropics. You don't find them 
in the Paleo tracts. You don't find them in, uh, in Asia at all. Um, it's really interesting. And we see them eating these canidia and getting to watch his feet as he eats. Um, he, gets the, he gets them stuck all over his feet and his abdomen. And on the right hand side of that stromata, you'll actually you see a little bump. You can see it there. Um, that's an egg. We've observed these flies laying eggs on these canidia, and we've observed the larvae eating the canidia as well. Um, we were very uh, lucky to work with this British filmmaker, Jackie Poon, while we were in Ecuador, who took these amazing macro videos um, so that we could capture some of this on, on film and have good evidence. Uh, so we know these, these flies are, are important in the, the, fun, the you know, there's this important association. Um, I think it's sex. We set out to test it. Uh, brief pilot study, we bagged a bunch of young chlamydia with a um, mesh that excludes both spores and flies um, and set them to develop for the two months I was in Ecuador last. Um, and it turns out these things take a lot longer than two months to develop. So the results are inconclusive, but suggest that they need to outcross to produce uh, fertile parathesia. Um, so this is something I'll be replicating on a grander scale and for a much longer time frame <coughs> this year. Uh, we're setting up insect exclusions um, in December, and we'll be harvesting them in May. Uh, so we should have plenty of time for the fungi to develop properly this time. Um, doing controlled crosses, using a paintbrush to simulate a fly, should be really interesting. Um, we'll also think these flies might be important to dispersal. This is mature Xylaria blibosa, the same one with just red exudates, um, but in the paraphyseal stage. And you can see, I think there's four flies in that photo. Um, so you find them when there's no canidia present for them to be eating. So why are they there? Uh, so, that's it. Um, so that's my second set of hypotheses, second question. Um, and then uh, this summer, so that was Ecuador, this summer I got the chance to go to Taiwan. Uh, the world expert taxonomist on the, on the Xylariaceae, who I really wanted to, to meet and learn from, uh, lives and works in Taiwan. Uh, so this man, Dr. Yuming Zhu. Um, so I got a little grant um, that took me to Taiwan to be able to spend the summer in his lab uh, working with these fungi. Taiwan is also um, tropical or subtropical, depending on who you talk to. Um, and Dr. Ji was able to set up some, some field collection sites for us, and we were able to, to do some of uh, some similar work to what we did in Ecuador. So I'm going to start out by saying that Taiwan is really different than working in Ecuador. Um, <laughs> it's a very populated place. Uh, this is the city of Taipei from, uh, from Elephant Taipei 101 is still the fifth largest building in the world. Uh, it's a strange place. But what I wanted to do in Taiwan was uh, bring this improved search image. From our Ecuadorian sample samples, we knew that there are other Xyleriaceous genera that are important to xenophytes, and I wanted to, to bring that um, into sampling. Instead of sampling just Xylerias, I wanted to sample Nemanias and Crushmatias and Rosalinias and Hypoxalons um, that we find as endophytes, but we didn't, we didn't search for fruiting bodies of because the literature had suggested that the genus Xylaria was the most important end um, I also wanted to try a different sampling scheme. Instead of a football field size grid, I wanted to bring this logarithmic sampling scheme. It's been pioneered in other microbial ecology studies um, where we can get um, spatial data that is both fine scaled and large. Um, and uh, importantly, I wanted to use it because that species saturation curve didn't level out at all. I wanted to bring much more intensive endophyte sampling too. And we can do this by sampling uh, more leaves at each location and more material from each leaf. Uh, but most importantly, using next generation sequencing techniques to get at uh, the endophyte community without culturing. So we just we can pull the DNA straight from the leaves and get an idea of the, the fungal community present um, without having to go through the selective filter of culturing the endophytes out. So in Taiwan, we worked at a place called Fusan, uh, which is in the north of Taiwan. Uh, it's a botanical, um, botanical garden and preserve um, up in the mountains, about 600, feet of elevation, 600 meters of elevation, pardon me. And um, you see that little blue square to the left-hand side of the map. That's a 25 hectare Smithsonian forest dynamics plot. Um, and then the, the blow up to the right is the map of, the, of that 25 hectare plot. 500 meters on the side. Um, for comparison, our Ecuador spot um, filled in just the tiny
tiniest if you go to the first tick mark on the x-axis and halfway to the first tick mark on the y-axis, that's everything we sampled in Ecuador. Much larger area. And we're able to do it because of this, this logarithmic sampling scheme. We sampled from the intersections of each line on those logarithmically nested boxes. Uh, one square meter um, at the origin, one square meter right next to it in all three directions. And then so it's one, two, four, eight, 16, etc., out to 128. And then we replicated that six times across the site. Um, and because this is a Smithsonian long-term forest dynamics plot, we've got all this other ecological data that's been collected over the years that we can also use to, to analyze our data with. Um, so much more informative. Uh, this is a view. Uh, that, that hill in the middle of this photograph is the hill that you can see in the middle of the map. Um, so this is the Axis Trail. Uh, it's still, despite being on a, a populated, uh, well-developed country, um, it's still really difficult to get to the field site. Um, we stayed in a, a little field camp. Um, very, it had electricity, but very primitive. Um, and we had to hike for about an hour and a half each way um, over um, a 400 meter elevation change every day to get into our field site. Um, and the forests are beautiful. Um, the, Taiwan has a similar amount of rain as Ecuador, about four meters a year, um, but much more seasonal. Um, they get about uh, two thirds, uh, I guess a little less than two thirds of their rain in the winter and about one third in the summer. And all the rain that falls in the summer happens during typhoon events. Uh, so they get slammed by hurricanes several times over the summer. Uh, so when it's not typhooning, the sky is fairly clear. Um, the forests, however, are, are incredibly thick. And these are primary forests. They look a bit like secondary forests because the typhoons make it a really high disturbance system. Uh, and when we went out, we found some old friends, uh, Xylaria schwanitzii and Xylaria tilparii that we collected in Ecuador. Um, much less common in Taiwan, but present. These are considered uh, pan global or pan tropical species. Uh, we also found uh, a bunch of new things that were was really cool to us. Uh, Celeria obovata, um, neat little round fungus, um, and we, our improved search image. Uh, maybe supposedly the hypoxalons are more common in Taiwan than they are in the neotropics anyway. Um, but our new search image paid off. This is an annulo hypoxalon um, and uh, Crushmaria. Um, this is a Crushmaria pavimentosa. Um, kind of a funny looking place, but I think it's sort of cute. I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> uh, this is another Krushmaria. This is Krushmaria zanata. Um, is, Krushmaria zanata um, is one of the very few that doesn't really care about substrate as much. This is growing on a bamboo comb. Um, not terribly many of these grow on bamboo, and the ones that do tend to be host specific, uh, save for this fungus. Uh, this fungus is a little cosmopolitan. This is a hypoxalon, hypoxalon subrosalinium. Um, absolutely gorgeous color. Uh, uh, these ones are a new one to me. It's Xyleria hemorrhoidalis. Um, cute little guys. Um, and this, uh, this is a Xyleria, um, it's, well, it's, it's a Xyleria anisoplora like fungus. Um, it's potentially an undescribed species. Uh, yeah, so lots of interesting Xylerias. Uh, hypoxalons, other things in the family. Also some other fungi that were unfamiliar to us. Um, this white tree, this is a forest pathogen that I'd never seen before. They called it white silk disease. Um, and I haven't talked to anybody who knows what it is um, specifically, like what genus and species, uh, but it was a little frightening. Uh, you can't, it's hard to tell from this photograph because I was focusing on the fungus, but that tree is dead that it's on. And it spreads totally vegetatively. Um, when it gets on the twigs, it totally totes them and they become uh, limp um, and they fall off and wherever a fallen twig hits, you can just see the mycelial fans spreading out. Um, there were whole sections of the forest where the canopy was open um, because of this fungus. Uh, it's a little frightening. Uh, there are also other interesting wildlife. Um, capuchins in Ecuador, macacas in Taiwan, these are Formosan macacas, they're found nowhere else but Taiwan. So there, as well as other wildlife, Taiwanese face spider. Um, I think they call it a face spider because it's big enough to totally cover your face. Uh, it's the largest orb-weaving spider in the world, um, according to Wikipedia. I'm not actually, I haven't, I haven't checked the sources on that. Um, but it's the, this, this particular spider um, was 12 centimeters from head to the tip of the 
after them. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're huge. They're giant spiders. Um, also, the, the moths weren't, I didn't see too many moths or butterflies, but I saw lots of really interesting caterpillars. Um, particularly interesting, this uh, tasia is a stinging caterpillar. Um, and I found it because I brushed past a leaf that was sitting on and ended up with welts on my arm for a week. Uh, it's a really nasty sting. Um, and this fuzzy caterpillar on the bottom here uh, is a favorite food of those macaca monkeys. Um, they can't eat them because of the hair, uh, just straight out. So they take them and they rub them in their hands to get all the hair off, and then they eat them like hot dogs. <laughs> um, and speaking of eating delicious things, we also found um, lots of later ports. It's a different species out there, Latoporus sinensis, um, but it was everywhere in our field site. Um, so we brought a bunch back and cooked it at the field station, um, and then when we left, we also brought a bunch out, but we didn't have access to a kitchen um, where we were staying uh, in Taipei, so we took it to our favorite restaurant, and uh, they cooked it for us, and it's the best preparation of chicken of the woods that I've ever had. And so the, the, all of the, the data from Taiwan is still in process. The, we collected, collected all of these specimens and, um, and all of the, we're prepping sequencing libraries from all of the endophytes. And I, I expect it to be a much more conclusive study than the Ecuador study. Um, we're still processing data from Ecuador as well, but um, it was so small, it was a very preliminary work. It was mostly, that was a cataloging diversity. Um, in Taiwan, I really, I, I, I think will give us conclusive answers to dispersal questions. I wish I could present them to you here today. Um, I'll let you know how that turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my, my funding sources in particular. Um, the NSF uh, sent me to Taiwan and, and pays my salary, um, but the, most of the funding for the work has come from small mycological societies like this. Uh, SOMA has given me a small grant, as well as Cascade Mycological Society, the Oregon Mycological Society, as well as the, the Graduate Fellowship from the Mycological Society of America. Um, and that, that has largely funded um, everything that I've done scientifically. Um, so, yeah. Is that any questions? Yeah. Some of it has to do with, with some host specificity as decomposers. They tend to fruit on um, angiosperms, not gymnosperms, um, just in general. This is Lailaria hypoxylon, for example, will fruit on gymnosperms. But, um, but largely, you find them fruiting on, uh, specifically on broadleaf uh, species. So 
places where there are more broadly species and diversity of hosts, you can tend to expect the diversity from the, for example, they're much more diverse in the East Coast of the U.S. than the West Coast, uh, just because you have big broadleaf forests out there. Mm. Um, uh, not knowing a whole lot about Silariaceae, what, what are the uh, defining characteristics between the genera? Aha! The answer to that one was a picture, if I go way back. Um, so, Silaria, is the type genus, is characterized um, generally by having upright stromata. Um, you know, they, you think of them as sticking up. There may have been an easier way to do this. My Where is that? Ah, oh, there it is. Um, so Xylarias are characterized as having uh, upright stromata. There's actually some debate um, as to how the genus Silaria is, is right now paraphyletic. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, so, Silarias are characterized as having upright stromata, but there, there's, there's this old genus called Penzigia that was basically a dumping ground for Silarias that were not upright. Um, and they've been since lumped back into the Silarias. So now you get Silarias that are, that are basically pulvinate, um, and they call them Penzigioid to, uh, to distinguish them from things that are actually not upright. Um, so, the, what distinguishes different genera? Um, you know, sometimes there are really distinct um, distinguishing characteristics. Biscognioxia, which is one of the most fun names to say of any genus, um, is distinguished by having a bipartite stromata, where one layer sh is shed um, during maturity. They come up underneath the bark, and they create this two layers. Um, and then when they shed their top layer, they shed the bark with it, and then the, the, they can, they can uh, release their spores from underneath. Um, so that's a really characteristic of biscognioxias. Crushmarias are characterized by having um, uh, smooth surfaces as opposed to, to some kind of textured surface like the Xylarias. Uh, but again, they integrate, um, and that's a, a, that's a real issue taxonomically um, because the morphological features and the, ta and the molecular taxonomy uh, don't line up in a way that splits genera nicely. So it's primarily uh, uh, morphological The microscopic. microscopic features are, are also important, uh, for particularly for distinguishing species within genera, uh, but sometimes genera as well. So the, the genus Hypoxylon was fairly recently split into two different genera, Hypoxylon and Annulohypoxylon. Uh, and one of the distinguishing characteristics is the spores are these asexual, or not asexual, pardon me, asymmetrical, um, with kind of lemons that are, that are squished on one side and flattened. Uh, and in the genus Annulohypoxylon, the germ slit, where it germinates from, this is clear stripe, is on the flat side, and in the genus Hypoxylon, it's on the round side. Um, so this you know, microscopic feature that clearly differentiates those two genera. Um, and there are a number of others. Yeah. Well, what portion of the things that you found both in Ecuador and Taiwan would you say you uh, were able to identify based on nothing but macro characters? Zero. You have to look at the spores for these fungi to get them to species. You can get them to genus by macroscopic characters, but you need the spores to, to get them to species. Do you have a compound scope with you in the field? Ooh, I have a picture of that even. Uh, yeah. It was in the lab with the, the pink. Uh, <laughs> I guess maybe this is unnecessary. Um, wait, oh, except that I went the wrong direction. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, while I find that next slide, we can, we can ask another question. So. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, compound scope. It's, um, it's actually one of the uh, vial M20s, I think. Um, it's a nice microscope. Uh, the, the climate plays havoc on the lenses, though. I need to bring down new oculars with me um, this year. Really? Yeah, the, there, there is. Um, some, I would love to know what it is, uh, but I can't get it to culture. There is some fungus growing between the, uh, the coatings of the lens and the glass um, that's destroying my optics. Uh, this everything mold. My, I, my, my hat, I did, not this particular hat, but the hat I took with me to Ecuador, um, had probably seven species of fungus and three species of, <laughs> of moss growing on it by the end of the, se by the end of the season. Uh, everything molds. You know, you, you, set, you set your backpack down when you get there, you go back to it a week later, and it's blooming with penicillin. Um, it's just, it's incredible. Um, you have to put your electronics in 
sealed boxes with desiccant, um, or they'll just die. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an interesting climate to work in. It's wet. Studies, did you see any diversity vertically, uh, or did you sample vertically within tree canopies? Did you see different venom or species? Oh, good question. We're climbing a bunch of trees to answer that question this year. Um, that's we, We've been having a lot of fun uh, rigging up crossbows with fishing reels and be able to shoot into canopies to climb trees. Not trivial to climb trees in these forests. Um, but yeah, vertical sampling is one of our, our, our next big questions. Um, is there structuring of the end of the with, um, uh, and not just vertically, but you know, nearest neighbor uh, with exposure to, to light. You know, there's, there's lots of variables other than height that could be influencing end of the community. So we're, we're, uh, we're working on that. If I could follow up with that, uh, what was the average tree height? Uh, the canopy um, is between 30 and 50 meters uh, where we work in Ecuador. Um, so not terribly, terribly tall and not terribly short either. Um, it's actually a little shorter than our standard Doug fir canopies up in Oregon. Um, certainly shorter than the redwood forests here. But um, they, they fall down a lot, <laughs> which makes it a little scary to climb. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sampling of this for other branch fungi in the studio like these? The in the canopy, specifically? Oh, in the canopy? Um, there's some work, there's uh, some really interesting canopy research going on um, at La Selva in Costa Rica. Um, but I don't, actually my, my, my colleague Dan Thomas was the person to ask that question about. He's heading up the, the vertical sampling effort and has uh, read up much more, much more thoroughly on uh, canopy work than I have. No, I mean that currently. Yeah. That's all they've done to the canopy. Uh-huh, I think so. no. Well, no, but there were other there were other people working on you know, like your like canopy soils and yeah yeah I don't know. What what other kinds of wood rotters did you encounter along with the Valeria uh, fungi on these walks? It sounds like a highly competitive environment, but I'm not sure. It is highly competitive. Um, every now and again, you find something with multiple species uh, fruiting simultaneously intermingled. Um, honestly, with the Silarias, usually it was the sole fruiting fungus really? on a given piece of wood. Wow. Mm -hmm. so they colonize very, they're very aggressive. Um, and you, can, you can see that in culture as well. They grow quickly and profusely. Um, they're very they're jealous of their substrate. Uh, and they form part of why they carbonize is they're forming exclusion borders to keep, you know, they, they, they set out these, in the, you can see the petri dishes, they set out 